Welcome to Next to Madison, a podcast to help you live your best life. Welcome back. Another exciting episode of Next to Madison. This is episode 159. And on today's episode, we are going to talk about sports betting. I actually have never uh, bet on sports, um, except for the fact when I did like an office pool where you would purchase a box like for the Super Bowl. But that was kind of it. I haven't really done much. Um, It's probably because I don't fully understand it. It also wasn't legal for a very long time, so they were always like underground type of bets. But now uh, 20 states, I believe, have legalized uh, sports betting. So you're seeing a big increase in companies like DraftKings and FanDuel. Uh, I think Barstool Sports has one that's that's either launched or is, is coming up. But it's becoming a big thing. People love to go to Vegas. Vegas used to be the only state where you could actually do online sports betting. Um, and now other states have opened this up. So it's increasing, you know, this demand for this. And there's so many different um, tools that you can use to bet on sports. You're not just betting on the game or the spread. There, you, there's also ones where you can actually like bet on the players. So I don't know much about this. So I, I, the guest today uh, is, is an expert in this. He is, works uh, um, at an investment bank covering this specific sector. He's also been the founder of, of several different companies. One of them was called uh, Betcha Sports, which was sold off to a larger conglomerate. So we're going to hear more from him, kind of dive into this and um, educate ourselves so we can, you know, uh, make uh, better bets, so to say. I don't want to say safer bets because I don't know if there's anything as a safe bet, but make more intelligent bets. Again, this is covering kind of the financial area, but we do not give financial advice here. We give you the information, you do the research, and uh, only bet, especially only bet, what you can afford to uh, to lose. This is something that's supposed to be fun. Um, you know, create some excitement, create some money. So we're going to kind of get the tips and tricks. But anyways, please, uh, just a reminder to rate, review, and subscribe to Next to Madison on your favorite podcast platform. That helps us out a lot. And we'd love to hear from you guys. So please don't be afraid to reach out. Leave us a review, what you like, what you don't. Preferably just what you like would be great. Um, You can always, you know, email us as well. So anyways, I am going to stop talking and we're going to be right back after this brief message from our sponsor with our guest on today's episode of Next to Madison. This episode is brought to you by Balance 7. Balance 7 is a concentrated alkaline with a pH of 11 plus. I didn't realize that acidosis is responsible for almost every infectious disease in our world today. With COVID-19 and the world opening back up, I started taking Balance 7, and after three days of taking it, I feel better, I have more energy, my focus is better, I think clearer. This supplement is amazing. Thanks, Dr. Norastani, for the recommendation. And all Next to Madison listeners are able to try it today by visiting balance7.com and enter code word MADISON for a complimentary gift and free shipping. Welcome back. We are with our fabulous guest today on episode 159. We've got Andrew Fabian, who is going to educate us on all things sports betting. So take it away. How did you get into this? Great to be with you, Madison. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming on. It's awesome to be here today. So sports betting in the United States is a relatively new and exciting industry, at least from a legal industry standpoint. Uh, For myself personally, I was working in a entrepreneurial setting doing sports fan engagement technology. And in 2018, when I was working on that business, the Supreme Court agreed to hear a case that was essentially challenging the federal law that had outlawed sports betting and other types of online real money gaming in the US. And that caught my attention. I used to be an attorney and I read a bit about it and I thought, you know what, this case is probably gonna prevail. I think the federal ban is gonna get struck down. And my mind started going to ways that sports betting could become mainstream in the US if in fact the court decided the way I thought that it would. And in fact, in 2018, the Supreme Court struck down PASPA, which was the federal ban which basically then opened the door for the states to decide for themselves whether they wanted to legalize it, and if so, how. 
And so what I did was along with a couple of uh, partners, I co-founded a online sports betting business called Betcha Sports. And the idea was to make sports betting a fun, engaging user experience that people would want to do, not just to make money, but to have a sort of community-oriented social experience around the betting. And that's what we ended up doing with the company. And ultimately, it just got acquired by Vivid Seats, the sports ticketing company, in December of last year. And for myself, I've now transitioned. I work for a bank, Citigroup doing technology investment banking, where I cover the sports betting and online gaming space. Well, congrats on that. That's amazing. To, to start a company and then to sell it is quite an accomplishment. So kudos to you. So was it hard, got real, real quick, a real pivot, was it hard going back to corporate America? It was different. Everything has its own challenges. And you know, when you're building a business from the ground up, you need to worry about how are you going to keep the lights on? What's my product going to look like? And those kinds of things when you're in big corporate America, someone else is worried about and thinking about. Yeah. But there are really, you know, new types of uh, you know, challenges, but also opportunities. And I really love the ability now to be able to provide strategic advice and help with financing the next generation of businesses that I believe are going to take this industry really to the next level over the next five to 10 years. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Because before it was just legal in Vegas where you could basically do it. I mean, Vegas is like its own country. You know, you can, <laughs> buy, a, you can buy a hooker and bet on the Packers and it's all legal. It's great. <laughs> all at once. <laughs> Right, exactly. So did you did you ever have an interest in sports betting when you first read this document in 2018? It's funny. I was a big sports fan. I you know, love sports like many Americans. I think 82% of Americans self-identify as sports fans. Yeah. But I never really bet on sports. I certainly saw it. And when I had gone out to Vegas for trips over the years, I might have walked into the sports books in, in, inside the casinos and you know, place a random bet on a sporting event that happened to be you know, going on that night, but it was never something that I was hardcore into. Okay. So w when you saw this document, you were like, okay, there's an opportunity. I'm going to take advantage of this. It was right. Exactly. Really. I mean, for me, it was driven by knowledge of sports, but seeing the business opportunity I had in college, I was in a fraternity. I lived in a fraternity house and I was in the vast minority that didn't bet on sports, I would say. So it was something, I saw there was a passion for it. Uh, the American Gaming Association said that there was an $150 billion a year illegal market in sports betting before the 2018 decision. So it was a pretty unique opportunity where a lot of times if someone's starting a new business, they kind of have to try and guess like, oh, is this gonna be a product that people are gonna want? It was pretty clear to me that people are gonna want to bet on sports. And I, we just came up with a better way for people to do it. Okay. That, I mean, that's amazing stuff. So I want to get to, if somebody has never participated in a sports bet, what's the, what's the best way to, I want to use the word safely, but there is no, no such thing as safety when you're betting. What's the best way to go about it to do your due diligence, so to say, to increase your chances? Definitely. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, there's, you know, these days there's a number of online offerings. Some of the best known ones are DraftKings and FanDuel. There was another one called BetMGM and Caesars. Uh, the first two of those had kind of come from the daily fantasy sports world. The other two were well-known you know, casinos with properties in Vegas and other states that have now you know, brought an online offering. And the most common and sort of easiest to understand types of bets are what are called money line bets or spread bets. Uh, and those are bets on the outcome of the game. The money line is you're essentially betting on which team is going to win. So it shouldn't be able to get you know, any more easy than that. Uh, football, you're betting on the Giants against the Cowboys. Who's going to win? And the payout on your bet can be impacted by the whoever the, the favorite is. You're going to get paid less for a bet on the favorite versus the underdog because the probability of the favorite winning is greater, so then the payout is less. 
Um, and so that's sort of the, the most simple kind of bet you can make is on the outcome of the game. Before the game starts, you pick one team that you think is going to win. You can choose the amount of money you're going to bet. And, you know, on the apps these days, you know, people micro betting, uh, which is considered any bet under uh, $5, is a very prevalent, you know, kind of betting. So this isn't just high rollers, people, you know, throwing down thousands of bucks on a, on a, a game or an individual bet at once. It's, you know, people for the most part who are looking to enhance their sports fan experience to make the game a little more exciting for them by having some sort of financial stake on the outcome. Okay. Well, that's good. So the, and you can do the micro bets on all of the competitions or the games. That, that's right. Most of the apps allow for, you know, that you basically choose your own amount. Um, okay. there are, so there's, you know, certain types of bets where there's minimums, but for the most part, it's, you know, choose your amount. It's, you know, should be at least from the dollar standpoint, can be as simple as, you know, inputting on a Venmo screen, how much, you know, you're sending to your yeah. friend for, you know, whatever debauchery you got into together the evening before. Uh, but you set the amount and then the app will tell you what your expected payout is if the, if your, your prediction or your, your bet uh, comes in. Okay. So that's cool. So yeah, if you guys have not done sports betting, start with micro betting. Yeah, start with you know, small amounts and, you know, it's the, the right way to at least get a you know, flavor for it. And it's certainly you know, not for everyone. It does seem to be something that a lot of people you know, do enjoy. Uh, and when done you know, responsibly or with some degree of uh, balance, it can be a way to just make sports uh, you know, a little more interesting or exciting for you. Yeah, absolutely. And so... Are, are these sites, is it every sport or is it primarily just like football and basketball? It's every sport. It's everything you can imagine. They are providing what's called action on it. Uh, and action is basically, you know, markets. It's an ability to bet that. And when the pandemic uh, had its you know, onset, a lot of sports were shut down. Um, yeah. you know, People remember the NBA kind of playing their playoffs inside of a bubble. Before they went to the bubble to play, the league was totally shut down. So you had people who still had this urge to bet, and they were fulfilling that urge by betting on things like Russian table tennis. So there is <laughs> – <laughs> so, you know, often Russia somewhere, people are playing ping pong, and people from the comfort of their couch – were sitting there, you know, betting on it. And, you know, it got people through, uh, you know, hours of, uh, of uh, lock, lock, lock up and, uh, you know, inside their homes. And so it's yeah. uh, just of course, the, the fact that you can really bet on anything. Well, that's, a, that's amazing. And um, so how many companies now, obviously, we the most common are FanDuel, DraftKings, but there's a, sounds like there's a ton coming up the pipeline. There are. I mean, just in the market today, um, New Jersey was the first state to legalize uh, sports betting after the court's decision. Yeah. And New Jersey, the way they set up their legal regime, they basically said that each of the existing physical casinos in the state would be given three skins, which in a skin is basically the right to offer an, an online uh, gaming service. And there were 11 casinos so they essentially created the opportunity for 33 online offerings. So just in New Jersey alone, you have approximately 30 online offerings. So while you do have the names we talked about, you know, amongst the top three or four have approximately 70% market share, you do have a long tail of offerings that are you know, looking to carve out a piece of the market for themselves. Um, I think one interesting one to flag is Barstool Bets. Um, they, you know, as since you're in the podcast world, many few people are familiar with, uh, with Barstool Sports, yeah. the media and streaming platform. And they have over 50 million monthly active users on Barstool on the media side. And Penn National Gaming, which is a regional casino business, they have properties in 14 or 15 states, went and bought a significant minority stake in Barstool Media. And as part of that deal, got a long-term license of the Barstool name. 
So they are now offering barstool bets, which is both a online sports book as well as an eye casino wow. in New Jersey, a lot of the other major markets and trying to tap into the passionate barstool media audience to convert those sort of sports fan media consumers onto their gaming offerings. That's amazing. So did you say, what is it, 20 states? I think you sent me in your notes, 20 states have legalized this so far? That's right, approximately 20 states um, have now legalized online sports betting. And then the iCasino, which is sort of the online table games, like online blackjack and the kinds of games you would see yeah. inside of a, a casino, has only been legalized in, I think, five or six states at this point. So that's kind of been a, a laggard, but it is expected that when this market matures, and there's debates about will that be three years from now, six years from now, but it's expected that approximately 40 to 45 states will legalize both sports betting as well as uh, iCasino. Hey, you wonder what the delay is because the tax revenue they're getting from this has got to be phenomenal. So it's like, what, what do you think the delay is for these other 30 states? It's a great point. And I'm you know, based in New York and New York just came online in February, right around the Super Bowl this year. And New York's taxes are actually meaningfully higher than a lot of the other states. Yeah. Uh, so it is a significant revenue opportunity uh, for the states. Um, with that to your question of, you know, so why wait? Um, there are a number of constituencies in each of the states. You have the brick and mortar casino owners. You have different types of uh, you know, groups that either want gaming done in a particular way. You also have anti-gaming factions in certain states who think for whatever reason, you know, gaming isn't something that's good and don't want to have online services who are lobbying against it. So different state legislatures have their own sort of bureaucracies yeah. and considerations to work through. Uh, California, a massive market, is a place where it's expected that eventually they'll legalize, but it'll probably be multiple years before you see products coming to market. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting now because it's like what is it's not like we're talking about marijuana, you know, or like mushrooms. Like it's like let people do, you know, educate the people and let them make their own damn decisions, right? If they're dumb, that, sorry. <laughs> Matt, I sign you up to do some lobbying for the industry. I know, right? How much does it pay? I'm in. Anything for money? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> If they're throwing around big bucks on marketing. Do you know what's crazy though? Think about this. Think about this for a second, right? They won't legalize online sports betting or online casinos, but yet they're letting their people run OnlyFans pages. <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with OnlyFans. I think it's, I should have done it myself. It's hard to reconcile things sometimes. <laughs> But I'm like, why don't they have a, why don't they have a stop on the, the, you know, cam girls? Like what is going on here? I, I support the cam girls. I'm not against anything, but I'm just saying this seems like a very, very funny kind of thing to stop. It seems like just let people do what they want to do. The lines get drawn in all sorts of weird places. Right. No, it completely, completely. So um, explain what, there's a different type of platform that uh, you brought to my attention, which was Mojo. Yeah. Which is where you can actually bet on the players. It describe, explain more about that platform. Absolutely. So they just came out of stealth mode and don't even have a product in market yet, but they're basically creating a stock exchange kind of offering except instead of you know, trading the stocks of companies that you like or want to sell short, now you're going to be able to do the same kind of thing except with players. So if you think a player is going to perform particularly well and the, other, the market hasn't sort of priced that in yet, you can go and buy that player and then you know, sell them as they start to you know, perform really strongly if you think they're going to drop off. So it's bringing that sort of like exchange or market model yeah. to sports betting. It's going to be a real money experience. They've raised, I think most recently, they just raised an $85 million Series A venture round from some really prominent uh, VC firms, including uh, Tiger Global, uh, Alex Rodriguez, A-Rod was in on the round. Uh, they've got a, a couple of founders who have a very successful track record. 
having previously wow. founded a business, diapers.com, that they sold to, uh, to Amazon. So slightly different uh, you know, industry than, the, than their prior uh, success or successes. One of the guys also founded yeah. Jet.com and sold it to Walmart. Uh, but you know, certainly a, a, a track record, and I think would expect they're going to be a force to be reckoned with when they bring a product to market, most likely during football season coming up. Okay, so do the players get a portion of these these bets? The players do not get any sort of direct portion of the bets, and most of the leagues have prohibitions against players having direct relationships for marketing or otherwise with the with any of the the sports books but indirectly uh you could argue that the players are benefiting from the increased engagement that you're getting from fans whether it's you know more people wanting to come to the games or to tune into the games which drives up you know tv streaming revenues which then drives up you know salary caps in the case of the NFL, where the revenues to the league sort of impact the amount that the players can get paid. So there's certainly arguably significant financial indirect benefits to the players, but no direct relationships. Okay, because I knew they couldn't bet, obviously, they couldn't bet on the games, right? Because they have a direct impact on that, that would, that would be crazy. But I didn't know because you're like buying and selling them. If um they got a portion of it, but that makes sense, I guess. Cause if somebody was doing a bet against them, then it could, it could get dicey too. If they decided just to have a shitty game. Exactly. It introduces a lot of issues. And in fact, in this off season, one of the players on the Atlanta Falcons just got suspended indefinitely for uh, apparently having placed uh, some bets uh, on games uh, on NFL games during uh, the season last year. So how did they prevent, because you work on Wall Street, right? There's all these like rules and regulations that prevent you from purchasing certain securities and when you could sell them and family members as well. So do yep. they have restrictions on the player's family members? The, it's harder because you know, these are individuals to restrict the, the family members. I think there are certain restrictions that tie, at least in some of the leagues, to spouses and to people who live in the same household okay. uh, as, as the athlete, but relatively hard uh, to enforce. And it certainly you know, creates, I think, a lot of questions because of the fact that, you know, while the player themselves, uh, you know, can't be, you know, participating, there's people who have access to information, right? And whether it's something where it's intentional, if someone's saying, oh, I'm going to purposely draw balls in the game, and that would be one thing. But even like, and to your point about, you know, I work on Wall Street, where we have rules against, you know, the ability to trade on inside information, because it's considered unfair. But, you know, someone who knows an athlete might know that they have a, you know, an injury. And that's why the leagues actually have rules about you know, disclosing injuries. You'll hear like before NFL games, they'll say, oh, this player's questionable or you know, this player's doubtful. The teams right. are actually required to post that information to the league. And it's all because of gaming and, and gambling to try and sort of level the playing field in terms of the information. But that said, you know, there are people who are closer to the athletes than others and probably can glean certain types of insights that – you know, you or I who aren't hanging out with athletes, or at least I should only speak for myself, yeah. uh, uh, you know, aren't able to you know, pick up on those sorts of, uh, uh, you know, inside information pieces. I mean, there's people out there that make their living on this. There definitely are. I believe uh, one of I the... actually met some. I was at a Nuggets game for my friend's birthday. I'm not a basketball fan, but um, – we went, she is, and we were at a bar afterwards, and there was two, a guy and a girl, they're business partners, not together, and they said, oh, we, we bet on sports for a living. It's amazing, and you, know, you say you're not a basketball fan, but if you start betting on the basketball games, maybe it'll make you a fan. 
Um, That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but there's definitely, yes, yeah, so you're experiencing it you know, firsthand. And you know, it sounds like they want to go be able to watch over their investments if they're showing up at the game to you know, see how their, their bets are paying off. But there's definitely uh, a, a lot of people who are out there uh, doing it as more than just something that is uh, sort of a, a you know, side fund. Well, yeah, because it's, it's kind of like, what is the strategy? There's got to be some sort of strategy. I mean, they have to obviously do their due diligence. And, and if it's, you know, their job, they got to make a certain amount. It's, it, it's hard to do. And, you know, there's an old saying that the house always wins. And the, you know, the house sets the lines. You have people whose job it is to set the lines just so, so that basically the house will win whichever side ends up, whichever team ends up winning the game. So, and that's, you know, the lines will move. A team could be favored by three and a half points, but if there's, you know, too much money that's coming in on them, then maybe the, you know, the spread will go up to four and a half or five and a half or six and a half points to try and balance out the money that's coming in on either side. So there's a lot of sort of under the covers, the, yeah the sports books are doing a lot of work to try and ensure that people can't make a living off of them because it's a zero sum game at the end of the day. If everyone's out there winning, that means that the house is losing and that's uh, not a, not a very good business model. Yeah, that's, that is true. So I've always wondered this when you like, where do they, where do they keep the money? Do these, do these sports companies like have a bank where everything goes in and then it just paid out of that. So they just kind of have like a constant, like giant Venmo account, essentially. It's a great question. And what it, it's a very evolving answer because of the fact that this was an industry that was basically illegal you know, three years ago. You have banks, a lot of the banks have rules against banking gaming companies. And even though it's now being legalized on a state by state basis, the banks aren't sort of like jumping in, you know, full force immediately. And so you see a smaller subset of banks that are willing to do things like hold the customer funds. And for example, there's a bank called MVB Bank in West Virginia. It's publicly traded, but you know, okay. it's certainly not a household name like a you know, a city or a Chase or Bank of America, but they are one of the few banks that are banking the real money gaming companies. And they've certainly benefited from the growth of the industry over the last uh, few years. And it's going to be interesting to see whether some of the more bulge bracket uh, household con commercial banking names move into the space and compete with the MVBs and some other smaller banks that have been willing to bank it. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I keep forgetting that it would, it wasn't legal like four years ago. So this is all kind of a new space. So yeah, it's like where it did go. And that's interesting. Like when there was $150 billion that was vetted illegally, like who was keeping their hands on that and paying this out? Tony Soprano. Right. <laughs> that's true, right? New Jersey. Yeah, that's, that's where it is. So yeah, you, you had... You had bookies who are actual you know, real physical people. Uh, and then you also had uh, what were called offshore illegal sports books, which were people basically offering uh, web-based betting. Um, the app stores generally kept the apps out, but you could still have you know, web apps. And the money would be held in places like you know, Costa Rica, uh, but people were placing you know, online bets. They were just doing so illegally before this change in law. Interesting. Yeah, it, it is like, it's just fascinating. So there's going to be a lot more companies that are obviously coming up, which could be another thing if you don't want to do sports betting, maybe it's something because you see the volume of the industry based on the fact that there was $150 billion traded illegally that you could invest in the, the company. Like in the Absolutely. stock, you know? Yeah, totally. And there's a view that, listen, you know, that if people were willing to bet 150 billion when it was illegal, and there's at least some percentage of people who won't do something if it's illegal, but would when it's legal, that kind of feeds into some of the more bullish views on the industry that this is gonna be a $500 billion a year market or even larger. 
uh, as it becomes something that's both mainstream and legal. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's just so much, there's just so much more money, obviously, you know, in flux in the economy through the printing, but also, you know, people have figured out ways to, you know, become wealthier on their own without having to go to a nine to five type job. So you do have, have more money, especially with the rise of the, you know, cryptocurrency market where, you know, people are doing very well in the NFTs and all this. So there, there is more money to go and, and play with. And I think people are starting to kind of awaken in a way to where it's like, I don't want to have some guy tell me I can take off or not. Like I'm going to go do my own thing. Like apparently March, there was 4 million people that quit their jobs. This past great, year. Yeah. That, it's amazing. And it, it feels like there's a, a seismic shift that's going on. And it's you know perhaps in part generational, uh, a different mindset of the younger worker. But it does feel like that it's almost across age brackets and perhaps across socioeconomic backgrounds as well, and it's just people are making new choices for their lives, and it's you know creating new types of you know, businesses and services, and it's yeah. going to be really fascinating to see how this plays out in the years to come. Oh, I know because it's kind of it's just one of the. It, I mean, it's fascinating. I'm all about people living their dream and doing what they love, and there's nothing worse than seeing somebody who hates their job because it just spills out into every area of their life and their life is, is miserable. So there, but here's the thing is like, yeah, I want everybody to be an entrepreneur, but at the same time, we need people to work for the companies. <laughs> <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Right. So it's kind of like all of a sudden you can't find anyone because everybody has their own company. You're like, wait a second. This isn't, this isn't exactly how it's working, but it is cool that there's so many great ways to make money, right? There's the online betting or the, the, the gaming, the sports betting, which is awesome. There's the crypto, there's the traditional stock market. If you want to play in that more regulation, so not as fun. There's only fans pages, Again, I don't have one. I, I guess my morals kicked in. I don't know, but I'm like, who's the idiot? It's obviously me. Probably should have had, had a page by now, but <laughs> I met a girl that made $500,000 last year. $500,000. It's amazing. There's certainly, there, there's a lot of demand for it. So. I know. I'm like, and nope, stay your course, stay your course. What would Jesus do? Stay your course. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the bumper sticker. Well, I, I'm long anything that you're involved with, Madison. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's like, oh my gosh. But yeah, I heard that and I was just laughing my ass off. I mean, I'm like, good for her. Like, that is insane. Like, she made more than like most people I know on Wall Street. It's amazing. Not all people, but most people. You've got... You know, a focus on things like engineering and you know, China and India and, you know, here, perhaps we are taking our eye off the ball a bit. And that's why the economy is, uh, you know, not, not as strong relative to you know, some of the competitors as it was, uh, you know, years or, or decades or generations ago. But, uh, you know, things will continue to evolve. And yeah, I think that you know markets sort of take care of themselves. And if there's yeah. demand for something, you find people to you know fill the supply. And it seems like uh, there's certainly you know a fair number of people who are making good money uh, you know, participating in those kinds of services. Well, exactly. You know, I'm all for if you can make money not working for a traditional job. Like you're a hero in my book, because most people can't do that. So whatever you're doing. Hey, I, I'm not here to judge, you know, just teach me how. No, um, <laughs> everyone's going to go. And after this episode, Madison launched an OnlyFans page. No, I would have done it a year ago. Trust me. Um, is this the here? Is the what? Is this the big reveal? Uh, no, no, no. Can't do it. Can't do it. I don't know. Talk to me in a year. We'll see how it goes. But no, this will be a very good year. I've got some exciting exciting things coming up so hopefully i'll have more extra money to bet on sports right now my my biggest my betting so to say it's not really betting i mean but it's been you know crypto 
kind of diving down that that path. But I I, the, I only you know buy a few meme coins, which is what I call bet coins. You know, you're really just kind of you know betting on it. Like I I've got Elon Musk on like uh, notification every time he tweets, it hits my eye watch because he can move the market so quick, especially on these little like funny meme coins that are basically have no utility. It's just him talking about it. Um, but that, yeah, that would be like the, the betting part of it, but I do want to get more involved in, in sports betting for fun, but just a little amount. So I like those, those micro bets because you're right. If you really, if you have something truly vested in the game, it's going to be more fun. And that, that's the idea is that it should be a form of entertainment. When yeah. you take a step back, like, I think that the stock market, if you look at it historically, you know, depending on what your, your time period benchmark is, it goes up anywhere from five to 10% a year on average. So it is over the long haul, a good way to make money. And you know, crypto, at least, you know, the, some of the major coins over the last several years have been great ways to make money. There's been ph phenomenal ways made. Whether that will last is for other exits. Elon can probably come on and opine on that. It's going to last. I'm definitely, I'm definitely a non, non, I don't like, uh, I don't like shit that's regulated and um, prevents people because somebody said that these people are stupid because they don't have X amount of money. I'm talking about accredited investors. Yeah. Um, I don't like that market as much anymore obviously i'm invested in it through other other vehicles i'm not an idiot but crypto i really think is going to be the dominant force and this is my opinion but i but because people want to even the playing field yeah people aren't stupid they know it's a risk they know there's no guaranteed it's like let people take those risks for themselves don't prevent them from getting into some pre ido or ICO or IPO because you don't think they're smart enough because they don't have, you know, a certain amount of cash. I mean, that's just insane. So I think, you know, crypto will be a good, a good um, long-term play. I think they're both going to coexist together nicely. Yep. Um, I just don't want the SEC to get involved with the crypto because they really, they really fucked up the stock market if you ask me, you know what I mean? <laughs> But I'm, I, also, I'm also speaking from like, I'm not super, super rich yet. So I'm like, I'm the little man. I'm fighting for people like me who have become successful and are doing well because, you know, we don't have all these like regulations. You can, the market never shuts off. You can, you're competing with, or you're not even competing, but you're, you're the, the influx of cash is coming from every country. So I don't know. I just love it. But I always tell people again, not a financial advisor. Do your information, get the research, do your information, and become wealthier on your own. Sound advice. Yeah, exactly. As you're sitting at a the traditional investment bank, I'm like, fuck the banks. No. <laughs> no, it's amazing. I mean, each bank's doing it their own way, but there's definitely degrees of engagement uh, with, with crypto. So, you know, from, and as well as sort of the broader blockchain technologies and yeah. NFT. It is, you know, very much something. It, it, it's fluid. Nothing's been, you know, finally decided how the relationship is going to be. But if you just look at the language of some of the major bank leaders, whether it's, you know, Jane, our CEO here at City, or Jamie Dimon at you know, J.P. Morgan, they, you know, whether it was six, seven years ago, I think, you know, Jamie was saying, you know, that crypto and Bitcoin was you know, worthless and people shouldn't be touching it. But now there's much more sort of moderation or moderation and exploration of what the relationship is and what it's going to be. So it's, uh, it seems to be getting much more sort of mainstream mind share than it was a few years ago. Oh, for sure. And I, and I, hopefully, you know, it looks like they are starting to coexist together. I mean, considering Fidelity is now letting their customers come in, you know, through uh, the retirement funds, which is really great. I mean, I talked to my financial woman and I, a year ago, and I said, are you guys doing any um, crypto stuff? And she said, no, not yet. And I said, well, I got news for you. You better take a class. You guys better all sign up for a course and start getting in on this because the, the ones that do, the advisors that are just sticking with stocks are going to get left behind, whether you like it or not. 
It's just the truth. I think everybody should be fully educated. And then I get another call saying, oh, is everything okay? You haven't really invested much this year. And I'm like, because you don't do crypto. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're giving Learn me a great crypto. She was like, they, oh, okay. If it's big enough that even if they're going to be against it, they should get educated about it to know why they're against it versus it just being some sort of knee jerk reflex. I mean, I would love, and this is eventually going to happen, obviously, you know, the market, so the crypto market is so volatile, right? It's kind of like it's sports betting in a way that there is, there, there's a little more risk because it never shuts off. It's always going, you don't know what's coming in. It's based on like, you know, supply and demand. There's so many different things. I mean, some people made, you can make a billion dollars on a coin, but then you can't sell it because you end up crashing it and there's nobody to buy it. So it's not liquid. I mean, there, there's a lot of these different situations, but that's why I always say invest in like your blue chip cryptos, I'm going to call them. Like the ones that have a really good roadmap, have a really good team, have like something, you know, good kind of um, behind them. But yeah, I think it's, I totally lost my train of thought. I get on crypto and I'm like, blah, 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 blah. But yeah. no, but it is an exciting, ex very exciting time. And hopefully we'll, we'll kind of, you know, it, but oh, this is what I was saying. It would be so nice to call up like, you know, a, a crypto wealth advisor. Like you can now, right? You can walk into like a Citibank or Chase. And you could say, I have $60,000 and I don't know what to do with it. And I don't want it to just sit in the bank. Like, can you help me? And sure enough, they sign you up for an account and they put it in an account and they do you know, take your risk tolerance and you're on your merry little way. We don't have that yet for crypto, which I think is good because people are educating themselves, but it would be nice to say, Hey, here's 15 grand. Like go, go have fun. Totally. Listen, we've got you know, room for people who want to do their only fans accounts. We've certainly got room for people <laughs> who are going to give, you know, crypto advice and, you know, hearing that makes me think maybe that's your your, your next move is as the, the 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 different types of financial institutions are you know embracing this that it sounds like you're on the cutting edge of where this is going and you can be someone who helps to bring it from you know a smaller percentage of the population that's engaging to a larger one. Does that involve me working for the man? No, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. Not there in the first place to resign. Right. There you go. Exactly. I'm like, I'll do the marketing, the speaking. But yeah, it's, it's, it is amazing where everything's going to go. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, different companies that will see a big shift and some that'll disappear and some that'll become profitable and new ones that are going to come up. They always say when the economy, you know, we could be on the brink of a massive recession. I think we are. Some people think we're not. I think we are. That's when some of the most amazing, innovative companies are born. Absolutely. So it's an exciting right. time. And especially with the sports betting, I feel like when things get really bad, people's risk tolerance like goes up. Yeah. It, listen, to, to your point, I think that as you know, if, if the economy goes into periods of recession, you tend to have more people who need to go you know, fend for themselves. And it feels like even through this last boom cycle, people have chosen to do that but it spurs innovation. It causes people who maybe, you know, had the opportunity to do something, you know, safe and less innovative to be off on their own, thinking of the sort of next thing and to be pushing the envelope further and kind of tying some of the things we've been talking about here. Like there's certainly views on how crypto and sports betting can come together. And that makes some people's minds explode because they're like, gosh, we're just, you know, having enough trouble trying to get sports betting legalized in certain states and the people in the crypto world are, you know, sort of dealing with their own sorts of uh, potential regulatory issues and they're like, why even try and put them together? But it does feel like that there, and there are some companies, uh, mainly in Europe, that have already started to take some baby steps towards that. And it feels like that will continue. Yeah. And it was just recently announced that uh, one of the cryptos, Algorand, uh, the COO has been on this podcast and uh, it was very, very educational, informative uh, interview, but they just signed a deal with FIFA. There you go. And now it's they're like on the blockchain and it's like a huge thing. And I think that we'll, we'll, we'll probably see more of that kind of happening. And, and maybe even the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, all these different sports organizations might end up 
you know, obviously going to the blockchain in some sort of capacity. So it'll be very interesting to see. But yeah, that does make sense. I mean, for crypto, for for sports betting, it's like you know, bet on this game, and you could have like a you know something you know. It's going to cost you, you know, 10 Cardanos or whatever. You just go to the exchange, buy some Cardanos and, and go on. But I think, you know, not everybody's there yet. So it, that's where it can kind of get a little little dicey. But it's going to be Good an time. interesting time, Andrew. It's going to be very Rome, Rome that. Yeah, <laughs> this is true. It's very, very well said. So um, any any other tips of advice before we wrap up of like how to kind of protect yourself when you're doing sports bets, like how to, you know, don't be an idiot and bet your life savings. Okay. If you're going to do that in Vegas, like there's a special rock you should probably live under. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> That's the right answer. It should be, I think like many things, it should be done in moderation and it should be viewed as a form of entertainment. You should be prepared to lose, you know, whatever you're, you're betting. And, you know, there's certain things like you buy tickets to a game, that's a sunk cost, but you're getting something for it. You're getting the experience, the entertainment. And I think the approach for consumers to gaming should be the same, that it's money that is basically out the door, but it's enhancing their watching of it. They could win money if they do, it's a bonus, but they shouldn't be counting on that to put food on the table or to uh, you know, pay their rent. Right, exactly. Except for those two people I met at the Nuggets game. Um. <laughs> people who are you know, professionals, it's something you really got to go all in and study it and kind of understand all of the nuances. And it's, uh, you know, it's a select few who can do that and do that successfully. I just thought of an idea. Uh, everybody that has $100 to blow, go in and just put on a shit ton of micro bets. You're bound to win one of them. There you go. As long as you win one, then you've got enough to, uh, to, to play another day. Well, exactly. That's what I'm saying. You gotta, you gotta, you know, hedge your bet. Yeah. Don't just make one, like. Just one. And that's, there's, there's an old saying in the gaming industry that the biggest bet is your next one. And Right, because someone asked me, he said, "Well, you know, what's the, the biggest bet that someone has?" And I was like, "Oh, the Super Bowl or the NCAA Finals." They said, "No, it's the next one," because there's always the next one in sports. There's there's an evergreen you know nature to it, so it's it's fun, it's alluring, and as long as you treat it as entertainment, unless you're that couple at the uh, the Nuggets game, then it can be a, a little extra spice for the life. Well, I, exactly, and it, it should be viewed as as fun. Um, but yeah, it's like uh, you know, why put a hundred dollars on one game if you could spread them out and increase your odds? Yeah, we could do a follow up and talk about there's these things called parlays where you put more than one bet together, uh, and you can even you could do like nine or ten or twelve leg parlays. So it's basically you're making twelve different predictions at once. The payout is astronomical. But the catch is you've got to get all 12 right in order to win. And the more legs you put in a parlay, it becomes more and more like a lottery because your probability of winning becomes you know, pretty uh, microcosmic. But the potential payout, if you were to come in on all of them for you know, a small sum of, of money you can enter, becomes you know, quite large. And so there's some people who like to do those, even though they're going to lose almost every time, if not every time. It's just that excitement of the what if mm -hmm. that brings them back. Well, it's like the lottery. You know what I mean? Like, why do people waste their, their money on that? I mean, you've got a better chance of like getting eaten by a shark. <laughs> lightning, I think. But people, people love it. They do. Oh, and the good news is don't forget, um, you guys, I think it applies to this too. It does apply to the lottery. You can deduct your expenses against your winnings. So if you lost a thousand dollars sports betting, but you made two thousand, correct me if I'm wrong, you only you only have to pay taxes on that thousand because you can write off those losses. That's how the lottery works. It sounds, I don't provide tax advice, but I do believe- I think believe that's true. So remember, you can always save, keep record of your losses. 
because when yep. you do win, because I want everyone to win, that's why you listen to this podcast to get happy, healthier, and wealthier. Yeah. You can deduct it so you don't have to pay taxes on the full, let's say two thousand. You only have to pay it on the thousand or fifteen hundred. So that makes sense that it's on a net basis. And I know yes. in the old days used to hear about people, you know, sort of having to, you know, keep their tickets or receipts from the casinos as proof of I mean, that's one of the things about things shifting to online now is you generally have a pretty good ledger of uh, done for better or for worse. Yeah, no, it, exactly. And it, it's so true. And there's just so, so many things that are kind of um, coming up. There's a lot of pay to play games now, which is kind of similar to these, you know, I games that are being legalized. But yeah, have fun. There's opportunity everywhere. There's always great ways to make money. And that's what you guys should do. Educate yourself. Um, don't go betting because Madison Malloy told you to. I never said that. I said, go have fun if you can. Uh, not financial advice. But yeah. Oh, here's another thing I just thought about. And I'm going to share with everybody because I'm so kind. Um, if you're doing a money line bet where you're just betting on the team, Grab a friend, you bet on one side, they bet on the other, you don't have the same last name, and boom, somebody's going to win. Is that totally that, illegal? <laughs> no, I think they, it won't be. That's brilliant. There, there's a bit of a, a vig where the casinos have kind of figured out where, like, if there's equal money on both sides, the way they, do, they structure the payouts, the casino's going to end up making somewhere around you know five to ten percent of the total amount that gets bet. so if so if you put in 10 bucks and i put in 10 bucks and we're on opposite sides of a money line one of us is probably gonna like pull out 19 bucks and the other one's gonna be on a net basis and the other one's gonna be and we're gonna be out 20 uh between us so the house will end up taking in a buck for that you know five percent yield off of the 20 percent that got bet. Oh, interesting. We'll just up the bet. Up the end. Yeah, make it a little bit different. There we go. That, now we're getting into a good fun. It's like hedging. Yeah, exactly. You know, I just thought of that. And I'm like, there's always a way to win. There's, there's got to be. So where can, um, I mean, as I say, where could we find you? But I don't, you don't have, you don't own Betcha Sports anymore. So What's the best way to, you know, or where do you want to drag people to? Like, what's, you know? Yeah, I've got no you know, vested interest in any of the particular you know, sports books or casinos. I just think it's a fun, exciting industry really driven by you know, entertainment. And I think it's great to be getting the word out there about the fact that this is something people can do. Yeah. I don't think it's for everyone, but you know, for people who you know, view it as a way to enhance the entertainment that they get from their sports fandom, then I think it can be a cool thing. And the more people who are you know, checking it out, uh, experiencing it, you know, maybe providing feedback to whoever they're getting the services from will you know, allow the industry to keep evolving and being better for the people who are participating in it. Yeah, well, absolutely. It, it's it's pure entertainment. Everybody loves entertainment. But I like that thing you you did reference in the in earlier in the conversation when you're saying you spend money on the sports tickets, and once you once you leave, that money's gone. So you could think of it kind of as that. But it'll be very exciting. I want to look out for the new companies coming up the pipeline. Maybe you can let me know. Uh, obviously, if it's legal, I don't want you to do anything illegal. Um, but you know about about inv investing in the, those companies because I think you're right. There is going to be a massive, massive uh, in influx of money that's going into uh, these industries. Yeah, there's definitely some interesting innovation that's happening, and a next wave of for the first few years have been sort of about just the tent getting stood up. Yeah. But now that the tent is up, I think there's going to be some really interesting new features and products that are going to be making this a more enthralling experience so it should be yeah. a fun few years ahead for the industry yes well absolutely so you guys have fun go at your own risk never bet more than you can lose have fun enjoy life things are good right 
Andrew, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about sports betting. I haven't, I haven't covered this topic, so this was, this was fun. Thank you, Madison. It was a pleasure and an honor being on with you. Yeah, absolutely. And you guys listening wherever you are, thanks again for tuning into another episode of Next to Madison. And we will see you next week to find out who's next. Hey, your host here, Madison Malloy. Please make sure to subscribe to the show on all podcast platforms and please rate and review us on iTunes and Spotify. Also, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us at contact at next I thank you again for listening. Bye.